This is Dr. Weislogel, and this is the first part of a series of lectures on an essay written by Ignacio A. Correa that was originally appeared in the journal Abra in 1976. Uh, it asks a question that maybe many of you have asked, what is the point of philosophy? <laughs> Let's just get right to that question and see what Ignacio A. Correa has to say about that. Who's the intended audience of this essay? Well, A. A. Korea tells us. He says, first of all, it's written for those who feel the obligation to do philosophy, but don't know how. So think about that for a second. There are uh, allegedly, at least according to him, some people who feel a, a, an obligation, a, a duty almost, to do philosophy. There's something stirring inside of certain people uh, and uh, to, to do philosophy, whatever exactly that is but, that is, but they don't know how to do that. They don't know exactly what that is. And this essay is intended to try to help us. It's also written for those who are required to take philosophy courses without knowing why. Does that ring a bell with anybody? <laughs> you come to this university and you're required to take philosophy courses. You can't get out of here with a degree in anything unless you take philosophy courses, more than, more than one. And I've been at this uh, for quite a while now, and I know that that's a question that many students have. Why do I have to take this? I've come here to study biology or study, or come here to study business, management, economics. Why do I have to do all this philosophy stuff? Well, that's a question that gets asked uh, a lot. It was asked by A.A. Korea's students, and he tries to answer that question in this essay. So some preliminary questions he opens up with. What, so what is it about philosophy? It's, a, it's an unusual thing. He, he writes, why, he asks, why this determination to count on a philosophy that defends its own positions? I think what he's trying to ask there is, you know, philosophy has always faced this question. Why, why philosophy? Why should we do philosophy? Why does it matter? Why does philosophy seem like it's required to defend itself when so many other different fields of investigation again, uh, economics or biology or history or whatever, don't, don't seem to require the same effort at self-defense that philosophy does. So, so what about that? Why, why, why is it like that? Also, he asks, you know, why, despite the fact that the philosophy has to defend itself, uh, it, it, it survives, it, it lasts. Why this continued presence of philosophy for more than 25 centuries? As the, for, the foundation of the formation of, of Western culture, certainly, maybe more than that, maybe a, a Western bias in his uh, claim here. But to give you one example, something that we referred to earlier in the course, that the institution that you and I find ourselves in now is fundamentally a philosophical institution. It's founded on philosophy. It's the foundation of uh, education, and particularly higher education. Uh, so, so what about that? Philosophy is always uh, under uh, attack, if that's, maybe that's too strong a word, but it's always in question. Why do we have it? Why do we need it? And yet it lasts, it endures. Uh, so he says there's something special about philosophy. What is that? Let's see if we could figure out what that is. He asks some additional preliminary questions before he gets going here. Is philosophy uh, just a desire for pure learning? Certainly, that's something that we humans can do. We can, we can ask questions just because we want to know, not because we want to do anything that follows from that or not because it helps make us uh, more famous or, or more wealthy, uh, but we, we, we are the kind of beings who, who wonder. Aristotle says in the beginning of his book, The Metaphysics, uh, all human beings by nature desire to know. We wonder, not, not for any further aim, but just simply to know. So maybe that's it. And certainly a, a, a lot uh, has been uh, accomplished and, and, and our world, our history, our cultures have been enriched by people pursuing learning for its own sake, knowledge for knowledge's sake. Is it just a, you know, a question of erudition uh, and, and culture, you know, being well-read and, and a cultured person? Oh, well, I can say a few things about Plato or Aristotle or Descartes. You know, is it, is it just that, just sort of the higher cultural aspect of things, just like knowing philosophy is important, like knowing art uh, or knowing music, things like that? Is philosophy something that can be taught? 
Now that's a challenging question for us, maybe in particular for me, but also for you, because I'm employed uh, trying to teach philosophy. I'm a philosophy teacher. That's what it says on my tax return. And you've paid a sizable chunk of tuition uh, to be taught philosophy. And there would be a big problem, would there not, if we were to determine uh, that philosophy is not something that can be taught, or at least it would appear to be a problem if philosophy is something that cannot be taught. And we should keep in mind or keep an open mind uh, about maybe a different way to look at philosophy. Maybe even if it's not the kind of thing that can be taught, it's still something important to engage with anyway. And that's what we're going to need to think about a little bit. Uh, is philosophy something that intelligent people feel forced or obliged to engage in? Now, uh, what, what do we mean by forced or obliged? I mean, there's forced in the sense of peer pressure, like, you know, you know, the, the, the educated people know a little bit about Descartes and Kant, don't they? Know a little bit about who Plato was and what Aristotle had to say about this. That's the, uh, it's a peer pressure. It's a cultural pressure. But there's also this idea of force or obligation that we began to explore in that allegory of the cave by Plato. What was that force that broke the bonds of the person enslaved in the cave? What broke those chains? What was the force that got the first escapee to stand up and turn around and keep moving despite all the challenges uh, and struggle and even discomfort and pain that might be associated with it? What was driving that escape beyond? What is, is there something that drives us on that forces us into this uh, effort at philosophizing? Now, uh, he asks his philosophy for everybody, and, and, and he thinks in a sense that it is, but what does he mean by that? He says, uh, quoting now from page four, this does not mean that philosophy is only a matter for the wise. It only means that humanity has felt obliged or has felt that force, that urging, whatever it is, to philosophize, and that almost all people in one form or another, and on one occasion or another, have felt forced not to produce a philosophy. In other words, not to write a hefty philosophical tome where you write it all down and spell it all out, but to do something like beginning to philosophize. What he refers to as the awakening of the philosopher within human beings. You know, we, we raised the, 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 in, the, the, in the first lecture the context of a course like that, like this one. And we, we started out with the first question is, what does it mean to be human? What kind of a thing, if thing is the right word, is, it, is a human being? What kind of being is that? And we thought we needed to answer that kind of question before we could answer the next question, which is the ethical question. How is it best for us to be? And we needed to answer that question before we can ask what, liberation would really mean? From what, by means of what, to what, and for the sake of what? Right? Those are the questions that we raised earlier. And it may well be that to be human is to be a philosopher, not a philosophy professor, not somebody who has to take a bunch of courses in philosophy necessarily, not somebody who has to write a hefty tome spelling out their philosophical system. No one's saying that. That would, that would clearly be false. Not all of us do that. Not all of us can do that. Probably not all of us should do that. There's many, many things that human beings need to do or should do. But all of us, you know, we're, at, we're beginners, maybe even perpetual beginners in philosophy. Maybe philosophy is a kind of perpetual beginning to reflect on your life, to think about your life. And it's something that you have to begin again and again. It's not something you could get over and done with and finish and package it up and say, well, that's that. I've got it all figured out. Maybe that's not what philosophy is. Maybe that's why it only kind of masquerades as an academic discipline where you take a series of courses, get an undergraduate, graduate degree, and then you're an expert. Then you got it. Well, even if you know a lot about philosophy, maybe there's more to it. Maybe there's something else that requires us to begin again and again uh, with this urge to, to philosophize. Uh, Javier Zubiri, who we're going to talk about later, who is uh, uh, in many ways a Korea's teacher, and eventually they were they were great, very close, important colleagues with each other. Uh, you know, Z Zubiri 
was asked, you know, why do we study philosophy in one of his classes, one of his courses? And, and Zubiri says, well, for the moment, so that you don't ask that question anymore, that, that you'll feel like you at least understand that. Why, why do we do this? Uh, I'm hoping that by the time you're done with your studies, your formal studies of philosophy here at the university, at least you won't have that question. At least you'll know why we study philosophy, even though it's so unusual and different from the other disciplines. I hope, hope you'll come away with at least that answer, and Zubiri thinks that you probably will. All right, so the essay is divided into three main sections and then, and then a conclusion. So in, in here we'll just talk about part one, which is entitled Socrates and the Necessity of Philosophizing. Uh, know what Acrius says about Socrates, quote, this uncomfortable philosopher who paid with his life for his insistent need to philosophize. You all know the story. Socrates was considered at one time a friend of the, let's call it the left of, of ancient Athens. And another time he was considered a friend of the right in ancient Athens and nobody could totally figure him out. And eventually with all his questioning and, and asking for answers and demanding that people be able to give an account of themselves and that Athens be able to give an account of itself, he was charged with uh, corrupting the morals of minors and introducing new ideas, uh, and he was uh, convicted uh, on those charges, and he was sentenced to death, and he was executed, all because he asked a lot of questions and talked to a lot of people about his, his questions and, and potential answers. Uh, this, the, what Aecrea says about Socrates could easily be said about Aecrea as well. He made people uncomfortable with his questions, and he was forced to pay for his philosophizing with his life, as we'll learn later on in the course. Socrates, Aecrea says, was a philosopher because he was a citizen. Right? If he were not part of the polis, right, he would not have had the philosophical questions that he has. He, Socrates himself embodies the question of the relationship between philosophy, of asking and, and, and seeking wisdom, and living a political, communal, social life. He embodied that tension, that struggle. And if you have ever read Plato's little dialogue, The, the Euthyphro, uh, and, and I, if, you, if you took moral foundation with me, I, I know that you have, uh, you, you may recall the setting of this little conversation between Socrates and a, and a man called Euthyphro. They're both standing right outside the main court of Athens. Euthyphro is there to bring charges against his own father, as unusual then as it would be now, and Socrates is there because charges have been brought against him, the charges I mentioned uh, just a little while ago. And they're having a discussion about the nature of piety, because in the Athenian way of looking at things, you, you might think that trying to figure out the right thing to do would have something to do with what the gods might want. But if you simplify, they're having a question about justice. They're having a question about what's the right thing to do. Is it right that Euthyphro brings charges against his own father? Is it right that uh, um, uh, the, the persons who brought charges against Socrates, was it right for them to have done so? Was it right for Socrates to have been asking his questions and to have been uh, talking uh, to the youth of Athens about these important questions? Was any of that, was it just? Was it the right thing to do? And the setting of this conversation, it, it tells us something in Plato's mind about the relationship between philosophy and the polis and the city. If he had tried to make it a, a courtroom drama, in other words, if the setting was inside the court with the jury and the judge and all that, the judges uh, and, and, and all that, uh, the question of justice really couldn't be asked. Why not? Because courts, judges, juries, jails, bailiffs, law enforcement, all of those embody an answer to the question, what is justice? That's our answer. You want to know what Americans think of justice? Look at our justice system. Is it perfect? Clearly it's not perfect. But that, in effect, is our answer. Same thing if you want to know what we think education is all about. The answer to that question is embodied in our preschools, our elementary schools, our middle schools, our high schools, our, and our, our universities. It's embodied 
in those institutions. Those are our answers. So by the time you get inside the court, the question has already been decided, such as it's been decided, again, imperfectly, but it's been decided. If you're, metaphorically speaking, outside the polis, which is where humans can't literally be if we're social and political beings by nature, but if we were somehow outside the polis, then philosophical questions would never arise because philosophical questions of justice, for instance, only come up when we live together. When there's, you know, one cow and three people, you know, what do, what do we do about that? That It's only because we're social political beings that we have philosophical questions. And Socrates was an embodiment of that. So the, the relationship between philosopher and citizen, don't think of the philosopher as some alien being that comes into the polis and just shakes things up from the outside. The questions of Socrates are the questions of the citizen. Uh, were he not a citizen, he, he could not be a philosopher. The state in the ancient mind is the place for humans to reach their full potential. No one is an island. The only way I can be the best I can be is for us to be the best we can be. And the only way for us to be the best we can be is for each one of us to strive to be the best we can be. Know thyself. Uh, the, 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 the man of the, the Delphic Oracle that Socrates takes up, you know, know thyself requires a knowledge of the best polis. The big dialogue called The Republic, from which we get the allegory of the cave, uh, is a book that's about two topics at once. The whole book is, even though it's the same words, you can think of it as a reflection on what's the best city, what's the best political organization or community, and at the exact same time, you, it, it is a book about the best soul, how to be the best person, the best human being one can be. You can't answer one without answering the other. They're inextricably intertwined. How was Socrates different from other philosophers at his time? Well, there's a lot to be said about the early uh, uh, history of Western philosophy from the so-called pre-Socratics, the thinkers that came before Socrates, uh, and then Socrates and everything after. Uh, but Socrates following on a, a group of thinkers called the Sophists, who were, who were not philosophers in the sense that they were seeking wisdom come what may. They were thinkers, and they were important, and they had a political uh, effect, a political role, but they, but they found that philosophizing was, in a sense, too much for us human beings. Better to use our brain power to get ahead, so to speak, to give good persuasive speeches to have things our way. If we're going to use our brain power, so to speak, stop wondering about the, the nature of nature and just try to figure out how to get by, in fact, how to thrive in political community. It's about human beings. Well, Socrates agreed with the sophist to that extent. Yes, philosophy should be about us human beings first, not nature. Not that nature is not important, but it should be about us first. Nature is what it is in relation to us, Socrates would say. And where he differed from those sophists, though, is that he remained philosophical. He sought the truth about human beings, not not little t truths that could be used to, to, to kind of get ahead in the world. He, he It was truth for its own sake. He wanted to be wise about us human beings. Pursuing knowledge leads to the realization of how little we know. Uh, Socrates had a uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Socrates had a friend who had uh, wondered whether Socrates was the wisest one of all. So he went to the oracle at Delphi and he asked the question, uh, is Socrates the wisest one? And the oracle said, no one is wiser than Socrates. Now, oracles are very tricky. Uh, uh, <laughs> they are the mouthpieces of the gods, but they are not very straightforward. Uh, another story, a, a general went to the oracle and said, you know, was thinking about attacking the enemy on the other side of the river and uh, asked the oracle, what, should I do it? Should I go attack the enemy on the other side of the river? And the oracle says, if you cross the river, a great empire will fall. And the general thought, that's great, great news. So he mounted up the troops, crossed the river and was immediately defeated. His great empire fell. Right? It's ambiguous. Same with the claim about Socrates. No one is wiser than Socrates. You could take that two ways. You could take it like 
uh, Socrates is way up here, the wisest one of all, and everybody else is down here somewhere. He's wiser than everybody. So no one's wiser than Socrates. He's wiser or way wiser than everybody else. But that same sentence would be equally true if everybody was as wise as Socrates. It would still be true that nobody was wiser than Socrates if no one was less wise than Socrates either, if we were all kind of equally wise. And that's how that's what Socrates learned with his questioning. He said, look, the, really, the difference between me and everybody else is, is pretty simple to say. When they don't know, they don't know they don't know. When I don't know, I know that I don't know. That's the only difference. Neither one of us really knows with the kind of certainty we'd like to have. The difference is, I realize that. I recognize that. They don't. They think they know when they don't. So Socrates' Socratic philosophy, philosophizing, is a kind of humility. It's a humble philosophizing. Uh, it's not a know-it-all. It's somebody who says, you know what, it's really kind of hard to know, certainly to know it all. It might be impossible. Uh, so the goal of philosophy, in, in, according to Aakriya, is to become who you are and to build the state. To become who you are and to build the state. He's following up on this ancient Greek ideal of the inner relationship between the soul, as they would put it, and the polis. And Aakriya uses the terms humanization, that's becoming fully human, human as you are meant to be, the best you can be. And conscientization, and what he means by that is to become aware of how the polis, how the political community, how the social setting in which we all find ourselves, how that can be the best it can be, and how when it's not the best it can be, it impacts our goal of humanization. So those two processes, becoming who we are and building the just state, conscientization, they need to work hand in glove. You can't have one without the other. The ancient Greeks thought it, Aakriya does as well. Uh, the Republic, that's actually made of two Latin words, uh, res and publica. Res is the, the Latin word for stuff, substance, things, uh, and publica means the public stuff. So uh, Plato's book, The Republic, is about the, the public things. And, and for Aakriya, it's about knowing how things are, how they actually are, not how they seem, not just as they appear, but how are they actually. And it's also to know how things might be. We have to know both. We have to be clear-eyed about how things are. We, we don't want to live in a fantasy world about how things are. We, want to, we don't want to be duped by the appearances of things. We want to know how they really are. But we want to know how they really are so that we can figure out how they might be. How they might be. We need both the actual and the potential in our minds when we're thinking about ourselves in the polis. And, and Aakriya refers to this as a kind of critical knowing. Knowing with an eye towards what are the potencies, what are the potentials. What are the possibilities here? Philosophy, Aea Korea says, is polemos. Uh, that's the Greek word for struggle or battle or war. And the battle, first of all, is against oneself. If you're going to philosophize, you're going to be involved in a struggle. And first of all, you're going to be in a struggle with yourself. There is a constant dissatisfaction that one experiences when one reflects on one's life. Now that might not seem appealing, but think of the alternative. Think of what 100% satisfaction, total satisfaction, no more desire of any kind would mean for the kind of being we are, for a human being. What would it mean for all of your desires the things that you don't have, the things that you want, the things that you reach for, the things that you yearn for, what would it mean to have all of that extinguished? The short answer is, it would mean that you're dead. Because human beings are beings of yearning. We're beings of desire. We're beings of a struggle, if you, if you will. A, a beings who are never quite satisfied. 
we are the kind of people like on the Seinfeld episode. We're not interested in, only in what's on. We want to know what else is on. Right? That's just the kind of beings that we are. And we are uh, in struggle with ourselves not to get complacent with things, to think that what we are is all that we can be. But it's also a polemos. It's also a struggle against the powers that be. And by that, Acrea means those that think they know when they do not know. The unwise, as Socrates would put it. The very definition of the unwise, of a fool. The fool is one who thinks he knows when he does not know. That's pretty foolish. Right? Wisdom would say, well, you know what? I don't really know. That's wise. That might not be comfortable. That might feel dissatisfying because I want to feel satisfied. I do I truly do want to know. But I need to be honest, too. If I don't know, then I don't. And philosophy requires this, two, this struggle on two fronts, a battle against oneself and a battle against the powers that be. Uh, quoting uh, Aacree again from page six, Socrates had to let go of everything and what little remained to him the last burning years of his life, the ashes of his existence were snatched from him in the name of the gods and of the good order of the state. He asked nothing for himself, only the liberty to think and to speak his thoughts to the world. It was too much to ask because there is no state that supports liberty of thought. That's a strong statement that I emphasize there at the end. There is no state that supports liberty of thought. Why not? Well, that's a question we're going to need to ask as we go along in this course. First of all, to see whether we think Aacree is right. Maybe he's not right. Maybe there you could think of a state, a government, a nation uh, that supports liberty of thought. Total freedom to think and to say what you believe. Why does Aacrea believe that the state always bristles at the idea of full liberty of thought? You might think in our Bill of Rights that you know we have the freedom of speech says so right there. Uh, but are there limits? Are there certain kinds of limits on our speech? They, they might not be overt. They might not be obvious, but they might be there. We need to think about this. Um, consider this. Thought for Socrates was free, not because it was his, but because it was right, because it put justice above every other consideration. We're going to need to think about what freedom really means, what freedom for us human beings really mean. We all know the word and we all love it. We all want to be free. We want that more than anything else. But what would it mean to be free? What is freedom really? And we're getting a hint already of what Aacree is going to talk about later on about the nature of freedom. Freedom is intimately related to justice. Free to, to find the truth. Free in the truth. The truth, which is justice, is setting us free. You know, I've heard that phrase before. The truth will set you free. Uh, he sees that, Aacrea does, he sees that in Socrates and Socrates' life and his philosophizing. Um, reminder uh, from earlier discussion, truth, beauty, and justice, the good, uh, we, in philosophy we call those the transcendentals because they shoot through all being that is, all that is has a truth, a, a beauty or order, and a, and a way it's best for it to be uh, in them. Uh, these are inseparable. These are uh, what we call convertible. When you're talking about one, you're talking about them all. And uh, so when Socrates was trying to, when he put justice above every consideration, it's just saying he put truth and even beauty above every other consideration. Because when you're talking about one, you're talking about them all. Aacrea talks about philosophy as a vocation, a calling. You can hear the, the vocal in the word vocation. It's a calling. Something is calling us out, calling to us, calling us forward. Uh, a life without philosophy is not worth the trouble. Uh, when Socrates was convicted, he had to, to, to wait a period of time in jail due to 
call them technical reasons, before the, the his death sentence was carried out. And in that interim period, there was a lot of movement to try to get Socrates uh, sprung from jail on both sides. His friends certainly were willing to bribe uh, uh, any of the jailers, anything necessary to get Socrates out of jail and out of Athens and maybe to some place that he admired like Sparta. Uh, his enemies, the ones who convicted him, realized after they had convicted him and sentenced him that there would be political blowback. And all of a sudden, it was uncomfortable for them having to carry out the sentence. And they basically would have turned a blind eye and let Socrates sneak away because they could have used that. See, we we're telling you the guy was kind of a traitor to Athens. Look at him. He ran away like a coward. And yet they wouldn't have been the ones to, to execute him, which was, which was going to get some pushback. Uh, Socrates wouldn't go. He wouldn't go. They said, well, why, why would you go to Sparta? You, you've said you admire the Spartan way of life. He said, look, I'm an Athenian. I was born here. I was raised here. A Athens is like my mother. My mother suckled me, nurtured me, educated me, uh, defended me as I've defended Athens. And if Athens in its wisdom thinks that I should drink the hemlock, then that's what I should do. I, if you exiled me, if you exiled me, I would not be me. It would not be me who's in Sparta. It would be some, somebody else. To be me, to be Socrates, I have to be here in Athens. Think about that. Philosophy uh, requires uh, method. Uh, and the, 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 the word method comes from the Greek methodos, means to be, be along a way, following a, a kind of a path. And Aeacrius says, look, you know, it's all well and good to feel the urge, to feel the call, to, to be philosophical, but you got you to gotta know the way. You got to go along the way. It's a, there's a kind of a, a discipline, a weird discipline, but a discipline to it. You got to be able to define your concepts. You got to be able to know what you're talking about. And you have to hone your ability to be logical, both inductive reasoning and dialectical reasoning. Induction is uh, a, a reasoning uh, from uh, particulars to a general rule. You do it every time you drive over a bridge. You know, how do you, how do you know the bridge isn't going to fall down? Because it didn't the last 22,000 cars that drove over it. Doesn't mean it won't fall down, but, it, but, but it's probable. Dialectical reason, well, that's something we're going to need to talk about as we go along later. But you're going to have to learn uh, the technical uh, capabilities of a philosopher. It's not just winging it. It's not just emoting. It's not just feeling your way through life, although feeling and, and moods and attunement to what's going on is very important, but you can't be one-sided about it. So, so you feel the call, but then you've got to de develop the method. Uh, and uh, that's not easy. That's demanding, and uh, maybe that's why we're taking philosophy courses. Uh, because uh, we might all feel the, the, the sense of wonder. We might all want to have some wisdom and some knowledge, but we, we got to know how to get there. We have to know how to do that. Uh, and that's, that takes effort, takes work. Socrates as a guide for philosophers, you know, for us, for those who feel the necessity of philosophy, Aeacrea says this, to desire to know, to desire to possess true knowledge about humanity and the state, in short, about oneself, to understand this task as critical and operative, to do it with zeal for service, with detachment and liberty, to invest in it life's highest consequences, to do it in a technical manner that does not shun intellectual work. Well, there it is. You know, uh, if you looked at the introduction to this uh, essay, uh, you know that th this essay was turned into a pamphlet uh, for uh, beginning philosophy students at the uh, UCA in San Salvador, the University of Central uh, America, uh, Simeon Cañas, uh, and it basically was handed out. You, you want to know about philosophy? This, this is it. And in a way, this, this statement right here boils down uh, to, to a, 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 a terse statement what it's going to take. And, you know, maybe you need to just take a look at that passage, think about that, underline that in your in your reader and just ponder whether you're you're up for the task and what it would mean and what you would become uh, if you were to undertake that path that method you know I, I don't know if you remember from the last presidential election we're in the midst of uh, another one now but in the last one uh, uh, florida uh, senator marco rubio uh, famously said look we need you know f fewer philosophers we need more welders 
Uh, and uh, I, I want to argue, and I'm sure Aya Korea would argue, that Marco Rubio was wrong about that. Uh, Aya Korea puts it this way, philosophy, every day we see it better, is not sufficient in itself. But without philosophy, humanity would lose one of its greatest chances to know and fulfill itself adequately. He continues, if people are not concerned with wisdom, or what is worse, they think they have it when they do not. Remember what that's called? Foolishness. <laughs> they fall into the offense of inhumanity and should be considered dangerous, particularly if they have responsibility for others or are leaders of the state. Can I read that again? If people are not concerned with wisdom or what is worse, they think they have it when they do not. They fall into the offense of inhumanity and should be considered dangerous particularly if they have responsibility for others or are leaders of the state. Use that as a lens to look around your world. So it's not a choice between welders or philosophers. That's, that's where Rubio is wrong. We, we need welders. That sounds like a pretty cool job, actually. I like welding when I had metal shop back in high school. Uh, and we, and we need welders. We need all kinds of people. We need everybody else. But we need them to be philosophers. Not philosophy professors, that's a particular job like welder or accountant, but to be philosophers. We, we need people to philosophize. Why? In order to be the best we can be, in order to be human. It's an ethical imperative that we philosophize. All right, let's take a break and we'll come back to the next section of the essay. <laughs> 